Good afternoon, everyone. We are just waiting one, for one more person to come for quorum, and he is on his way, and he's sure he can be here before 5, so smoke him if you got him. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to call the meeting to order. At 4.59 on July 5th, this is the fourth meeting of the Rapid Transit Implementation Working Group. Sorry, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. We will call the meeting to order. We will uh, go to item number 1.1, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Do we have any? Seeing none, we'll carry on to number two, scheduled items. With Ms. Ramsey, our project director, and the Bus Rapid Transit project updates. All right, thank you very much through the chair. Um, I'm going to provide just a really brief project update on where we sit with bus rapid transit. As many of you know, we're now into our, our TPAP consultation stage. So I want to kind of tell you about some of the things that we're doing to engage with the public going through that process. And then what I'll do is I will introduce our guests for this evening, which are members from QTRIC to fill us in on some of their findings about what electrification of transit for our bus rapid transit system might look like. So quickly for today, I'm going to very quickly walk us through just the TPAP consultation stage, remind us what it is that we're consulting on and, and how we're engaging with the community, and then just briefly touch on some of the ongoing work that's also happening in our BRT office. And then again, introducing QTRIC. So just re-highlighting some of the key decisions that have got us to this point. Again, we kicked off our Rapid Transit Master Plan back in January of 2015. It was May of 2017 that the routes were approved by Council, and then shortly after in July of 2017, which is when we approved the Rapid Transit Master Plan and Business Case. So that essentially established that we're having a bus rapid transit system and the routes that would run on in the basic function principles and how many stops. And then moving forward on May 8th of 2018 was when we brought forward our draft environmental project report and our recommended BRT design for approval by council so that we can then move into the transit project assessment process, which is that final stage of consultation as part of the environmental assessment. So just to briefly touch on, on what's next and what's part of that TPAP process. Um, as I mentioned in the past, there's three stages. So we're currently in the 120 days of TPAP consultation. Um, a big part of that is, again, consulting with the public, property owners, First Nations, regulatory agencies. And we're trying to be able to um, refine our design, um, make our final environmental project report as best we can. And that's the end of that 120 days, is to finalize our draft report into a final version to go forward for final public review and then a Minister's decision. So we have 120 days of consultation that will wrap up on October 4th of this year. And then the public has 30 days to provide comment to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, which is now actually the Minister of Environment and Conservation and Parks. That's a new change. Get used to that one. And then uh, we have the Minister's decision comes within 35 days of that. So that would have us wrapping up our environmental assessment just in uh, early December. So again, kind of really trying to help um, set expectations around what it is that we are seeking from the public in terms of consultation and feedback at this point. And I really go back to that sort of cone of focus that we've been working towards where, you know, back in 2015, 16, we we're talking about what type of system we wanted. Then we talked about what routes it would run on, how it would work, where the dedicated lanes would go. And so now we've, we've had council approvals and decisions on each of those points. So we're at the point where we want to actually take that approved design and fine tune it to be able to make it the best design we can coming into our final environmental project report. But that isn't the end of the consultation. It'll continue onward through detailed design on an individual and a neighborhood basis. That's when we start looking at actually designing each leg of the neighborhood. And we'll be going through a meeting with business owners and property owners all along those routes to help, again, take that down right into the weeds and get the best design we can. So in terms of the focus of our consultation during the 120 days, there's really three things we're trying to focus the attention of the public on. And that is, again, reviewing that approved BRT plan. So we want the public to ask us questions, to help share their ideas for how we can fine tune those designs. We also want them to provide feedback on the draft environmental project report itself. And so again, that's something that is, we've got the main report as well as many technical appendices that support the recommendations of that report. And then there's a lot of people in our community that have interests in things like archeological and, and community heritage and all those different aspects. So maybe they wanna check out some of those technical, feed, uh, technical supporting studies and give us their feedback. So again, anything the public can provide, we're, we're happy to hear their input. And then we also want to help educate the public on what the matters of provincial importance are and how they can give feedback to the minister during that 30-day public review comment period. 
So how are we engaging during these 120 days? We have 12 formal opportunities. The first two were um, open houses that we hosted on June 21st. We had a little over 100 Londoners come out and participate in those sessions. They were more of a drop-in style, um, a little bit different than our previous open houses, where we wanted people to actually kind of roll up their sleeves and work through the designs with us and, and ask us our questions. And so we had some really great turnout, and we also had some really constructive conversations at those meetings. Also through the summer, we'll be hosting Transit Tuesdays. So those will happen every Tuesday at our Rapid Transit office starting July 10th and right through to September 11th. So what we'll be doing is keeping our office open so that between 3 and 7 p.m. people can drop by and we'll essentially have our PIC materials set up. People will be able to, similar to our sessions on the 21st, roll up their sleeves and, and come ask us their questions and, and work their way through the design. We've also created a virtual experience where we've overlaid our BRT design on a Google map type system where people can easily scroll around the design, look at renderings, drop comments right onto that digital map. And so that's something we've seen a lot of success with. And as always, people can phone us, they can email us or reach out to us over social media. So I'm gonna flip over really quickly and just play our very short uh, explainer video that we created to be able to, again, help the public understand what it is we're looking for from them during this consultation period. Come on, mute. That one. Yeah. Plans for London's BRT network are moving forward. but there's still work to do before construction begins in 2020. This summer, Londoners have 12 opportunities to help fine tune the BRT designs at our open houses on June 21st and Transit Tuesdays, every Tuesday from July 10th to September 11th at the Rapid Transit office. At these sessions, we want your feedback on the approved BRT plans, the draft EPR, and matters of provincial importance. Some things are confirmed, like the route network, dedicated lanes, and centre running versus curb running lanes. But there's still time to help us fine tune the BRT designs. Have ideas on how to improve BRT in your area? Questions about the studies behind the plan? Have anything to add? Let us know, in person at our open houses or transit Tuesdays, or online at londonbrt.ca. So it seems there's a bit of a drag on that. I apologize for that, but you got the idea of the video. Thanks. Flip it over. Flip over to the slide. Okay, so as far as um, what to expect for people that might show up at our Transit Tuesdays, um, we're gonna be again covering off, we always do the BRT basics. We find that even at this stage of the process, we have people that come out to see us and maybe this is the first time they're engaging in the process. They don't really know a lot about the basics and so we, we always have that as a component of any of our um, outreach or engagement sessions. Um, we also will be presenting the approved BRT design. So we'll have iPads on hand with our digital online tool as well as large versions of laminated copy. People can dry erase pen right on them and add their comments and all of those will be recorded in our draft or in our final environmental project report. Um, the technical studies will be all on hand and we've got some of our boards explaining the matters of provincial importance. So it's really any one of those Tuesdays we'll be able to have all of our PIC materials easily accessible. As well, again, the virtual experience. If you haven't had a chance to check out LondonBRTMap.ca, um, it's, it's a really easy and fun way to be able to um, see how the BRT system might look in every neighborhood. So you can scroll right in. The aerial footage is underneath it, so you can kind of visualize it in each neighborhood. And actually, this is uh, in terms of comments received to date, we've actually now we've topped over 240 comments that we've received through that online tool. And throughout the 120 days, we're gonna have ongoing engagement. Our Transit Tuesdays in those open houses were really our formal areas where people know where to find us and come find us at those sessions. But we will be going out into the community as well. We're gonna to continue to have a presence on social media. Um, we have a toolkit that we've developed that we're gonna be, is almost like a, a PIC on the go. It's got some basic information on it that gives people the same information they would find in that BRT basics corner of our PIC and helps them know how to engage. 
So we'll be going out and visiting with um, businesses and property owners along the corridor. We're going to be going to malls and libraries and making sure we're where people are and give them as much chance to be able to comment on, the, on our report and on the design. So just a real brief introduction to the toolkit. This is something that we've developed. It's a booklet that opens up and has inserts that we can customize as we go out, um, depending on who it is we're meeting with. But the basic five boards that are in that, again, touch off on all those basics and really help be able to explain people what the system is, how it'll benefit London, and then also um, how they can engage in the process. And so lastly, I just want to touch on some of the other things that we're working on. We've got a lot on the go in our office, so we're continuing to um, do our, we've had our kickoff on our discussions with the, with the Ministry of Infrastructure in terms of a provincial transfer payment agreement on how those will work going forward. Uh, we've been working with Infrastructure Ontario and started well into our process of doing an assessment of procurement options. So we'll be looking at a comparison of a traditional design bid build scenario versus some alternate financing approaches such as a design build finance option and they're going to be assessing that with a value for money proposal to be able to really put those two options side by side and help us compare the two the two from a benefits and and um I guess, a value assessment. So that's going to be really interesting. Uh, we have a safety audit that we've done. We hired a group to do an independent safety audit, so separate from our onboard consultants, to look at each of the intersections and aspects of our design to ensure that um, they can provide some recommendations to us that maybe we're not seeing because we're a little too close to it. So just having that third-party review from a safety perspective is a really great tool. And then we've also started a, started a rail crossing feasibility study, which is a, a layover from a deferred item from council earlier, just to be able to look at what are our options in the core for trying to deal with rail crossings going forward. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our guests. So to provide a little bit of background, um, for the past few months, um, the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium, or QTRIC, has been exploring the feasibility of electric buses for London's BRT project. And in order to give us their recommendations, they're trying to give us some recommendations or some feedback on how, whether, and when we would be able to consider implementing this green technology. So we're really excited to have QTRIC join us here today um, for our working group session. We've spent the afternoon with them discussing our project and talking about what electrification for London's BRT system might look like. So presenting today is Yusipa Petrunik. She's the executive director and CEO of QTRIC, and she's going to update us on available technology and outline her findings for London. So Yusipa is leading, a formal, uh, is leading the formulation of several national transportation technology trials related to zero emission transportation and smart vehicles innovation, including the Pan-Canadian Electric Bus Demonstration and Integration Trial, the Pan-Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Demonstration and Integration Trial, and the National Smart Vehicle Demonstration Project. Dr. Petrinik has built up QTRIX Consortium to include more than 100 private and public sector companies and organizations across Canada. Previously, she served as the lead researcher in electric vehicle policy studies at McMaster University and as a senior research fellow at University College London, UCL, in the United Kingdom in uh, science and technology studies. So she continues to lecture in globalization studies at McMaster University and in interdisciplinary research methods as part of the Masters of Arts in Integrated Studies program at Athabasca University. So I had a chance to um, see Yosipa present uh, earlier or towards the end of last year and, and she's really an excellent speaker and I hope you'll enjoy your presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to colleagues at London Transit, and thank you, of course, uh, here to everybody today, Chair, and all the honorable delegates here today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you a little bit here. I'm going to do a bit of a whirlwind tour, uh, take you through a high-level introduction to the initiative, and then take you into some of the data that we shared with your colleagues at London Transit as well, uh, to initiate this real technical planning around what electrification of your rapid transit ways could look like. I'll let you know what some of the next steps are in terms of ameliorating the research 
search modeling to make sure you have the most precise analytical tools at your hands and your, at your fingertips so that you know exactly what you're getting into if, in fact, you decide to go down this pathway in the future. We do have a little video, but we haven't actually tested it out here, so fingers crossed that it'll work uh, when we get to that to introduce you to how the initiative is actually unfolding in Brampton in York Region and Vancouver right now. Uh, so just to give you a high-level introduction, this project actually has three phases. Phase one has already launched, uh, technically speaking, with Brampton Transit, York Region Transit, and TransLink in Vancouver. The real uh, intention here has been to standardize electric buses with overhead charging systems at a high power level. So if you see the little images, the icons on the left and right-hand side of your screen, effectively these buses pull in, there's an overhead charging system, a rail pantograph drops from the top, connects to the bus in a matter of seconds, and then delivers a very high power of charge. So a lot of electrons in a very short period of time. The whole idea of this system, this type of system, is that it maximally reduces the amount of time transit agencies have to spend charging. So buses are not stuck, plugged into a depot for several hours. Instead, they have the ability to operate 24 hours a day, if you wish, as long as they're able to plug into these en route chargers. Now, of course, if you're a transit agency, you want to bring down the number of chargers to the minimal number of chargers possible. And as a transit agency, you want to maximize the amount of uptime of your buses. So that was really the orientation of, project, of the project. The technical goal was to make sure that the standard, the charging systems and the buses by different manufacturers were standardized. So a couple years ago, it was the case that if you bought a certain type of manufactured bus, it could only work with certain types of chargers. Or if you bought a certain type of overhead charger, it could not work with a mix and match model. So as a city, you were kind of stuck. If you bought into one bus, you were stuck with that type of charging. There was really no standardization you can play into. And of course, if you're dealing with taxpayer dollars and you want to go to a request for proposals, you want the cheapest possible price. That only comes when you have multiple manufacturers competing. Uh, so that's what the orientation of the project was. We've now launched with phase one. We're really delighted uh, that we were able to get municipal, provincial, federal funding, as well as industrial investment. Our key stakeholders in phase one were companies like New Flyer, Nova Bus, and then ABB and Siemens, along with several utilities and transit agencies in York Region, Brampton, and Vancouver. So it took a really good collaborative effort. And you can see that, that we're intending to launch with 18 electric buses, seven chargers, at a power level of 450 kilowatts. Uh, to put things in perspective, my Nissan Leaf charges at about six kilowatts, uh, six to seven kilowatts. And that's with, a, that's with uh, an AC level two charger I put into my garage. So most electric cars are down at a very low level of power. Uh, the highest you would get even for a Tesla is somewhere around 50 kilowatt, pushing it up to maybe 100 kilowatts nowadays. But really, we're talking about a whole different level of power. Uh, so into phase two, we're looking to integrate energy storage devices, get more systems involved. And that means putting on battery packs or flywheel systems that can harvest the renewable energy that is on the grid in Ontario today. Uh, that comes onto the grid at all sorts of times of the day, so it's green electrons, and also so that you can harvest cheap electricity overnight and then deliver it to your buses during the day when the price of electricity is quite high. Uh, again, for that, if you're a city like London, there's actually no standard for you to request uh, technology according to. So part of our project, we're trying to get the standardization to be published and get a bunch of manufacturers to agree to co-standardize. And so far, it's working out well. By phase three, the idea is to automate the entire process. So one of the factors that causes a bit of a delay is the bus driver has to pull in. There's still a visual cue. The bus driver still has to pull a lever or press a button to release the pantograph. The more we can automate this, the more seconds we save, the more time you have to charge, the more electrons onto your powertrain, the faster you can go as a total system. So we're looking to automate that pulling in and pulling out of the bus into the charging system. The more we can automate that little piece, the more we can save minutes, especially if your bus is running behind schedule. So that's essentially where the technology is going. And this particular project uh, literally puts Canada on the map. It's the first time in the world that you have multiple manufacturers pulling into and plugging and playing into standardized technology. So our little nation of 30 some million people has been able to punch above its weight and we're delighted about that. So we do have a little video that shares with you some of the excitement and I think we're, I'll just give it a try here. Is it just right there? Now, some of the um, ministers in this video are out of date, it so... It is a project <laughs> and integration plan. Brenton and York Region we'll start, will yeah. now have an infrastructure that meets the high environmental standards.
By making an investment in this kind of technology, in buses that are electric as opposed to diesel, uh, we know that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, to know that Brampton and York Region are participating with us along with Qtrick uh, is great news and our government's very, very proud to be making this investment in a brighter, cleaner, and in the case of these buses, quieter future for our transit riders. What's unique about what's being done here in British Columbia and through the Qtrick project is the fact that we have multiple bus manufacturers using the same to charge the buses, and nobody else has really done this. And one of the big key benefits uh, for our community are having very quiet buses in our neighborhoods. Um, when you're on the bus, the actual bus is a lot smoother and a lot quieter. And the best thing about this with our environmental friendly uh, master plan that the city of Brampton has, that we have an absolute zero emissions on these vehicles. This is a great project for York Region because we've made a commitment under our environmental strategy to be uh, greenhouse gas emission free by 2051. So what this pilot does is the first step to transforming our fleet to be green. We're really fortunate that we have a council that's been supportive in allowing us to participate in the Qtrix pilot. And uh, it's great that our partner, um, besides Qtrix, is Brampton. We have a long-time partnership with the city of Brampton, Brampton Transit in particular, where we do already have service integration. Uh, and we've had that for a number of years. So it's exciting to be doing this new pilot with uh, an old partner. Well, the first thing that you really realize is how silent it is. It is really incredible that you cannot hear anything. And it's uh, amazing when the people first step into the bus, an electric bus, they usually notice that it's so quiet that they stop talking. And then they realize that you can hear the discussion in front of the bus, even if you are on the back. Uh, this is really something that uh, most of the people, they are amazed when they see that. Well, there's, there's small scale and large, large scale economic benefit. Um, on, on a smaller scale, um, as vehicles move to zero emission or battery electric, we are employing more electrical engineers, more electricians, um, and, and technicians who are trained in, in the technology. <laughs> One of the wonderful outcomes of this project is the development of curriculum and training standards for the individuals who will be moving to this new technology. We're probably the largest trainer of automotive technicians in Canada and one of the largest trainers of uh, truck and coach technicians in Canada. And so uh, with uh, 11 million people around the GTA, uh, emerging technologies, electrification of vehicles are, are front and center when we're looking strategically directions we see transportation moving in. So the value of our project, of course, in electric busing is the focus on standardization. QTRIC stands for standardization, standardization, standardization. Of course, with standardization of high power charging systems, it enables transit agencies to get electric buses out on the road, reduce emissions, but also radically reduce charging times. So getting it away from a couple hours down to a couple minutes, and we're hoping a couple seconds in the future. Great. So that gives you a little bit of an introduction to the excitement uh, that accrued for phase one, and we're well into planning for phase two, although we're still <clears throat> finishing some of the technical work around phase one. Now, just to give you a sense of the kind of partnerships we need, this was phase one, uh, and as you can imagine, a lot of transit agencies put up their hands saying we wanted to enter into this kind of project, um, but not everybody was ready to go necessarily right away. One of the things you'll notice here is there's no rapid transit way. Although York Region is involved here, it's Route 44 and 55, not their rapid transit way. They were not ready to go to the rapid transit way for a couple reasons. They had a, a transit way that was out there. There was a branding associated with a particular kind of buses, and they weren't quite sure, having built out the rapid transit way, what the cost would be of retrofitting it for electrification. So our goal for phase two was to have a rapid transit way integrated. Uh, that's just a little bit about our launch and into phase two, integrating some of the energy storage, increasing the power level for the overhead charging systems, and bringing rapid transit way into the initial this gives you a sense of some of the transit agencies that have come forward to say, we think we are interested now in joining uh, uh, phase two, including London Transit potentially. And these are some of the companies that have come forward and joined the consortium to make sure that it launches effectively, that it continues to pursue standardization. And of course, several of the universities and colleges that have said, okay, now is the time to train the next generation of technician to make sure London Transit has people to hire in the next two to three years to be able to maintain and operate these types of vehicle systems. So just to take you now into uh, 
uh, the rapid transit way modeling a little bit, I'll spend a few minutes here to go through some of the high level conclusions. And I welcome any questions you might have. Your colleagues here at London Transit have gone through a lot more of a detailed analysis and we'll continue to pro provide updates to make sure we have the most precise predictive modeling. Uh, the intent of this type of modeling is to say, okay, you've, you've got some routes here. You've got fast transit routes uh, seven and L that you have proposed to uh, es essentially launch and build out. We know what they look like. We know how frequent you want the buses to operate. We know what the topography of the land looks like. We can do some adjustment, uh, adjusted predictions around how many riders you'll have on day one versus how many riders you'll hope to have day two and into year three and year four. So with all of those physical metrics or material metrics, we can actually predict pretty accurately with our manufacturing partners providing us with a lot of the detail around their buses uh, and charging systems. We can predict quite accurately how many electrons are you going to use every time you pull into a stop, pull out of a stop over a 24 hour period a day? Uh, how many uh, CO2 emissions are you going to save in terms of total CO2 equivalency, so noxious materials and others? And of course, we can predict your electricity bill, which you probably want to know uh, before you head down into this pathway. So just to take you through this high level summary, these are some of the calculations that we perform in-house at Qtrick. These are the two routes that we initiated the modeling around to be able to give your team some of these uh, predictive outcomes. This is route seven. As you know, it's about 28.6 kilometers round trip. That's important because typically when we have these high power charging systems, they're located at either end. So the bus goes out and there's a charger, the bus turns around and it comes back. You can sometimes eliminate a charger depending on the route topography and the route profile, but depending on the requirements, you either need a charger at the end points uh, or just one at the starting point. And then you have route L, a similar scenario. It's long enough that it requires probably a charger at each end. And so we wanted to figure out if that's in fact the case. And if it is the case that it needs a charger, how many minutes of charge time does it need? How much electricity will you pay for, et cetera? Uh, so we're going to take you through some of the data here. I won't spend too much time on the background uh, statistical work that we do, but I will summarize to you the modeling. Uh, so there's three duty cycles that we effectively model out for councillors, for city councils, for hydro companies, and for transit agencies. The first is from an energy consumption standpoint, your best case scenario. From a transit perspective, your worst case scenario. Uh, in energy world, the light duty cycle is your best. It basically, the bus comes out of the garage, it runs around the route, it does not stop, it does not pick up passengers, it does not stop for stoplights, it just runs around the route and comes back. And why do we model this? Well, we need to figure out how much energy and electricity you pay for to move that hunk of steel around that route. It's your baseline. Uh, everything else is gonna be on top of that. So it's definitely gonna be worse than your light duty cycle. Your medium duty cycle is a pretty typical day. Rapid transit routes, however, are a little bit unique in that you probably intend the rapid transit route to be operating at a high duty cycle throughout most of the day. That's the intention to move a lot of people. Uh, but we do model a medium duty cycle. So that might come, for example, on your weekend uh, or in odd hours of the day, say the early morning, when you have about 50% passenger load on, they're making 50% station stops, 50% of other stops. So if in fact it's not dedicated laneway, for example, and there are crosswalks, pedestrian crossings, they do have to slow down stop and restart. And every time you decelerate and accelerate, you're burning, well, essentially consuming electrons, not so much burning. Uh, so we need to model that. And then heavy duty cycles where you're pretty much gonna find yourself, hopefully, if your ridership augments to where you want it to be, all the time in, um, in a rapid transit way. And that means your bus is full. It's full of passengers, your auxiliary loads are on, which means your heating or your cooling systems are on, you're stopping for traffic lights, stop signs, yield signs, passenger crossings. So here we've assumed the worst energy consumption possible. You are stopping at every single possible location where there is a likely stop, including your scheduled stops for pedestrians, et cetera, and your bus is complete do uh, heavy loaded. So just to take you through some of the variables in the background in terms of uh, the modeling and the, ener uh, the engineering component, looking at the weight of the vehicle, the loads, so the heating, the cooling, the tire rolling coefficient, as we discovered tires are a very key technology here. Your tires can consume a lot of energy unbeknownst to very often transit agencies. Uh, and so the more efficient the tire, the more efficient your electric bus. The regenerative braking, and here as we mentioned to your colleagues at London Transit, um, you can set your regenerative brake and what this means essentially is that when the bus slows down, the motor turns into a generator effectively and it generates electrons. So you can play around with this. You can turn up the regenerative braking, which means the driver will feel something more like drag on the bus when it slows down, but you're generating a lot more electrons, so your, your energy consumption is a lot less. So it's kind of like fuel savings technique. Or you can really turn down the regenerative braking, not save so many electrons, but you have a really smooth, fast ride. Uh, so you can play in between depending on how you want to operate it. And then your gear ratio on the power 
powertrain. So not to take you too much into the coding, but just to show you some of the outputs. So here we modeled two of our bus manufacturing partners. Uh, we have Nova Bus and New Flyer, two of our partners. Now they do offer different types of powertrains. For example, New Flyer offers a powertrain with up to and over 400 kilowatt hours of uh, power. So going to those higher power levels, what we've modeled out are what we're working with in phase one right now. We're certainly happy to come back to London Transit to model other battery pack configurations. Nova Bus, uh, which makes buses out of Quebec, uh, has a bus that has 76 kilowatt hours on board. New Flyer, the one that we modeled here, has 200 kilowatt hours uh, on board and they manufacture buses out of Winnipeg. So a good Canadian story. If you take a look at the energy consumption, you can see that your bus on the same route, picking up the same number of people on the same day, will consume anywhere, anywhere from 0.4 kilowatt hours up to an over 1.6 kilowatt hours per kilometer, depending on how many people are on board, how much stopping and starting. So very often when you're preparing as a transit agency or, or as a city council, um, you're, you're often looking at which buses have the best kilowatt hour per kilometer. And what we always share with our municipal partners is there is no defined kilowatt hour per kilometer. It's not as easy to think of as the fuel efficiency of your car, where you have a stamp and a sticker in the dealer room that says in the laboratory it produces this amount of efficiency. Here, in effect, what you have is a very high variation, depending again on the topography, the variables, the ridership, et cetera. So it's really important that you model out your routes, which we have started to do with you so that you know what the situation can be. Um, what does that mean? It means when you take that kind of efficiency and you plunk it into the powertrain, you can come out with a pretty accurate account of how much state of charge or how much of your battery is effectively left for you to utilize once you get to the end point of your route. So here we're going to take a look at route seven. It's 28.6 kilometers, so about 14 point some kilometers one way. Uh, and with a Nova bus, 76 kilowatt hours, it means that if you take a look at where we say 5% buffer, it means that in the worst case scenario, fully loaded bus, you're stopping at all stoplights, every light is red, uh, every pedestrian crossing you stop for, so the highest energy consumption, your bus gets to the end point with about 63% state of charge left, which means technically it could turn around and come back. Uh, so you have the option potentially here, even with a fairly small battery pack on board, to actually go out and come back. Now, lots of transit agencies want a bit more buffer, so they're going to either put a charging station at the end point, and once you come in at the end point, you're going to top up, but you have a bit of buffer. So let's say you're running behind schedule, you don't have the time to top up all the way to 100%, you can top up to 80% and still make it back the other end where there's another charger waiting for you. And in a moment, I'll talk to you about how many minutes of charge you need. But it does say that, uh, surprising to us, that the current technology with a 450 kilowatt charger and the current buses available are more than sufficient for your rapid transit way. And I will say it was surprising to us uh, because I myself, from a physics standpoint, did not believe uh, that rapid transit ways could be accommodated by the current technology, which is why we didn't pursue them in phase one. Generally, um, rapid transit ways have the configurations of routes that you don't think of as easy to electrify. They're generally high speed, they carry a heavy passenger load, which is usually very good for electrification because the heavier you use it, the more you save. But when you're doing high passenger load with high speed, and very low downtime, it's very challenging to electrify on day one. Now that was 2016, fast forward to where we are 2018, and we're excited to be able to report to you that even with the smallest battery pack you can pick in the market right now for an electric bus, it's more than sufficient with the current technology. Now you have other options and everything goes up from there in terms of increasing the power level of your charger or increasing the battery pack on board. But you have these options available too. Taking a look at the new flyer, if you have a larger battery pack on board, you can see what happens when you play with the size of the battery pack. Same route, same topography, same ridership, same auxiliaries on, and it goes out and once it reaches the end of route seven, it has over 82% stated charge left. So that bus can go out and come back and go out and come back and then top up when it comes back. Uh, so you have a lot of strategies you can play with as a transit agency. Is your bus running behind schedule? Is it ahead of schedule? Is the price of electricity high? Do you wanna use the electricity right now or do you wanna do a couple runs and then top up when the price drops off in a few hours later? So you have quite a lot of strategies here and we're really delighted because it will be one of the first times in the world that a rapid transit way is electrified with standardized high power technology. So it really puts Canada on the map and that means that the city of London effectively will become a mecca for electrification. 
location. There's a lot of people who would be looking to how you were able to do it here. And it seems to be a perfect mixture of ingredients, just the right size of a city with the right level of, of uh, ridership, with the right kind of topography, making it happen a lot faster than a lot of us thought it could happen. Uh, so I won't spend too much time uh, on the other route, except to say we did it on Route L as well. We found that Route 7 and Route L are very similar topographically, very similar in terms of their physical characteristics. So what could have happened was, let's say we discovered one of your routes has a lot of hilliness. Well, that hilliness would have caused all sorts of outcomes in your state of charge, in your battery performance, et cetera. And we may have led to a recommendation that one route is easier to electrify on day one than the other. That's not appearing to be the case. Route 7 and L are pretty much synonymous with each other from an energy perspective. So you have a lot of opportunity here as a transit agency, your buses can play across the two routes. So your whichever vehicle systems you choose for Route 7 can play on Route L. You don't seem to have a challenge here topographically. Um, so some benefits there, it's fairly flat routes in both cases, it appears. Now, in terms of the charging, you probably want to know, well, how many minutes? So I get to the end of this, the route, and I know I have 60% state of charge or 80% state of charge, so good for me. And if it happens to be a medium duty cycle, I probably even have more. Um, but let's say I have 60 to 80% state of charge. How many minutes do I need to charge for? In the case of Route 7, if we have the Nova bus on your route with a 450 kilowatt charger, you need about there in the red, you'll see the heavy duty cycle. I'll only talk to you really here about the worst case scenario because that's what we all care about, uh, is about 3.5 minutes. So worst case scenario, you get to the end of Route 7, and you need to top up about 40% state of charge, it's gonna take you about three and a half minutes to do so. So let's say you're running behind schedule. Well, you don't have to top up for three and a half minutes. You can top up for two minutes and then top up a little bit longer at the other end. Now your schedules have presupposed five minute turnaround breaks. So currently, it looks like you're well within the five minute buffer. Uh, so you have some play time. Now, one thing I will tell you, however, here we have modeled out these buses as 40 footers and we know you want 60 footers. And so we are planning uh, to rerun the modeling with the help of our manufacturing partners to run the 60 footer. The 60 footer is heavier. It will consume a little bit more energy. It does not necessarily though mean twice as much energy or rather one third as much energy because it's not a linear pattern. Um, so you add another 30% of bus, but that doesn't mean you add the 30% of power train as well. So there are some cost benefits and energy benefits. So we'll come back to you uh, in a few months with that updated modeling, but we don't expect that it's going to take you over that five minute period. If it does, it will be marginal. And if it does, then the way that we address it is by increasing the power level of the charging system. So right now we're working with a 450 kilowatt assumption, but we're trying to get up to 600 kilowatts if possible. And given the timeline that you're working with around 2020, 2021 for procurement thinking, you're well within the right technological framework for us to be able to achieve this. So building it right and building it right the right time, uh, the first time. If we take a look at Route 7, same scenario with a new flyer, about 3.6 minutes. You see a little bit of difference between the Nova and the new flyer, and uh, there's just only tiny, tiny little bit more consumption on the new flyer. Well, it has a much bigger battery pack, right? So that's a little bit more weight that you see crop up, but extremely marginal difference. Uh, same thing on Route 11, or sorry, L. Uh, so you can see here that it's 3.7 minutes to 3.8 minutes, 3.85 to 3.9 minutes. And if you are in operating in anything less than a heavy duty cycle, you're talking about potentially under one minute of charge. So let's say you have a 24 hour cycle, you decide to run these buses 24 hours a day, and at three in the morning, there's really a light ridership. There's maybe three or four people on the bus. Well, you're operating in light duty mode there, so likely the worst case scenario is you'll need about 0.8 of a minute, so only about 40 seconds to charge up. So really what we're trying to do is radically reduce your charging times. Now I own a Nissan Leaf and that Nissan Leaf takes three hours to charge up, right? So this just puts things in perspective. Uh, when we often think about electrified transit, we tend to try and do it by analogy to automobiles. And we encourage people to not think about electric cars. When you're thinking about electric buses, they're a completely different kind of beast and completely different kind of technology. So I won't spend too much here. I'll just uh, conclude now on the price because you probably want to know what your electricity bill will look like. Now, a few things to say here. Uh, some of this data you will see refers to cap and trade. And as we now know, cap and trade may not exist any longer. Uh, so I'm going to explain uh, what will result uh, if there is in fact a carbon tax that you still nonetheless have to calculate. So that is embedded here. So what we did was we ran through the simulation to take a look at the diesel consumption and the diesel cost. So you can see here using your price points of what you currently pay on average over the last 10 years, 
on Route 7, apply this particular bus, a typical 40-foot uh, diesel bus. In this case, we had to use a 35-foot uh, diesel bus as a model, so the energy consumption would actually be higher in real life than what we've modeled here. Uh, you can see that you're spending up to around half a million dollars a year in diesel. Uh, on Route L, it's double because there's double the number of buses on that route. So th those are the price points for the diesel. It's technically going to be higher because, again, we modeled a smaller diesel bus than what you actually utilize, and that's just because it's the data that was available to us. Uh, then if we take a look at the schedule and we uh, plan out the schedule with e-buses on their 10-minute frequency and we go to the next one, we plan it out on a five-minute frequency, we have to do this for your electricity bill, right? So for diesel, it doesn't matter. You fuel up, you pay your package price, but with electricity, it really matters, of course, when you charge, right? The time of use has an effect. So we put that all into the electricity models that London Hydro effectively uses to charge you electricity. Uh, and then we plunk it into the route itself in terms of how many buses are going out and how many are coming in, noting that you're going to need uh, an approximate number of buses here. So according to this developed schedule, we're looking at about 24 electric buses on Route L and eight electric buses on Route 7. And moving through using those numbers, using the London Hydro rates, and then the time of charging, we're able to calculate the following. So on Route 7, if you use a Nova bus, Generally, throughout the course of that year, with all of those buses running along Route 7, you will see that your average diesel, though it will actually be higher, because again, to remind you, we used a smaller diesel bus than what you actually use here, uh, your actual diesel cost will be somewhere around half a million dollars, as noted there. If you have to pay for your carbon, it's going to be higher. Here, it's calculated at about 600,000 in the worst case scenario. Technically, it would actually be higher. So if cap and trade is, in fact, canceled, then you can eliminate the $18 per metric ton that theoretically would have been embedded in. But the proposed federal rate is higher. So if a carbon tax is actually imposed, in this particular scenario, the cap and trade would have been embedded in the price of your fuel. So you would have felt it indirectly. In a, cap, a carbon tax, you would feel it up front. And it would be higher than this, because unfortunately, we finished this modeling right before the announcements. Uh, and so we have it here at $18, but it could be 20 it could be 50, depending on what the federal government ultimately imposes. And you will have to pay that. There's no way to get around it since it's coming out of your tailpipe. Uh, so that means that you do need to calculate that. And then if you look at the electricity cost, the electricity cost is your electrons, of course, your electricity cost, your regulatory cost, which you have to pay to the regulator, and then your delivery cost, which is effectively a demand charge. Um, when you're delivering power at 450 kilowatts, you need an infrastructure build out because you need particular infrastructure to deliver that amount of power without melting the infrastructure. Uh, so when you put that all together into your uh, entire electricity cost, you can see here that the total charge for that Route 7 being electrified with Nova buses is about just under $300,000. So compared to about $600,000 for the diesel, you're looking at a savings about $300,000 a year on Route 7 with a Nova bus. You apply the new flyer, it's only a slight, slight, slight marginal difference due to slightly higher, well, a bigger battery pack, so slightly higher weight factor, and you're looking again at about $300,000 of savings. So without counting the maintenance costs, the refurbishment costs, and all the other costs that go into maintaining a bus over a 12-year life cycle, we can tell you right now that you will save in the heavy duty to medium duty cycle between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars per route uh, on your rapid transit way we expect it's actually in the final analysis going to be higher because of course your diesel bus is bigger and so when we come back we'll we'll share with you the data of the actual 40 footers uh, so you'll see a slightly higher diesel we'll also calculate the actual carbon tax which is slightly higher uh, and then of course with 60 footers you get magnitudes of efficiency so your diesel bus is going to be that much more inefficient and your electric is going to be that much more efficient for carrying that much more people. Uh, so we're happy to come back in a little while to show you what the final uh, predicted cost savings is, but we know that it is at least $300,000 per route uh, in the worst case scenario. Uh, so just same thing, now on route L, because you have double the number of buses on route L, it's double the savings. So you can see your total electricity on Route L say, cost is about $600,000. Your total diesel, again, with the same assumptions needing uh, amelioration in the future, is about uh, 1.2, 1.1 to 1.2 million. So you're saving about 600, some $650,000 per year on that route. So again, if we think about it in a 10-year cycle, you add up that money, how much more are you paying as a premium for your electric buses? Your return on investment here, not including refurbishments and maintenance, is somewhere around the 10-year 
earmark. Um, so that's just strictly on your energy consumption and your energy savings. So that comes down to the hyper efficiency of electric motors, which you just can't deny. They're just super, super efficient as energy conversion devices uh, and the inefficiency of diesel and thermodynamic systems. As much as we have pushed the physics of diesel engines and combustion engines, they are fundamentally inefficient machines. And so when you compare the two things, that's what you're seeing coming out. Even though the technology here is relatively new compared to diesel tech, and the diesel tech has gone through multiple iterations of improvement. So what we hope to do is come back, not only with some of the ameliorations around the 40-foot diesel or the 60-foot diesel and the 60-foot electric, but also with an economic model to share with you about some of those maintenance costs. I expect in the final analysis we'll see in London what we've seen in other communities, which is the return on investment is somewhere around the five to six year mark. Um, in some communities, it's down around the three to four year mark, but there we're talking about Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, large dense areas where you have a lot of people moving, a lot of weight, a lot of inefficiency in the diesel system. In mid-sized cities like London, Oakville, Burlington, Brampton, uh, Red, well, not so much Red Deer, Calgary is still on the higher side. In those areas, we're still seeing somewhere around the five, six, seven year return on investment rate. Uh, so hopefully that helped to answer some questions. Uh, now there is just a last slide here about uh, CO2 emissions reduction. And there you can see in terms of total CO2 emissions reduction, from the Nova bus, you're around 1,500 uh, tons. New Flyer, similar, similarly, around 1,500 tons. Route L is double, 3,200 tons. And uh, with the New Flyer, also double, 3,200 tons. Uh, to put it in perspective, under the old cap and trade system, a heavy emitter was 25 thousand tons. Here you have 3,200 tons just on one route in one mid-sized city. Uh, so basically you're effectively about one seventh of the emissions of a heavy emitter like a cement plant. It's an extraordinary extraordinary amount of emissions to save uh, just by electrifying a route. Uh, and I think often we don't realize how many emissions come out of our transit system. So it is possible to really optimize that and radically drive that down, if that is in fact a variable of uh, importance to the community, which we certainly hope it is. So hopefully that's uh, giving you some metrics and some details, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Pashurnik. That's, uh, wow, that was impressive. <laughs> And I know there are many questions, and um, I'm going to start um, from my right. Um, anyone here apart from the mayor? Harold? Okay. Okay. And Jesse, I know you too. And Eric. Okay, we'll move forward. We'll start with Councillor Usher at the end. Okay, good. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I just have a simple question. How many buses did you take into consideration with your cost analysis? You talk about the L shape, and, and you talk about the, um, from one location to another. But is it eight buses? This whole analysis was done with eight buses via the seven routes, just that? There we go, through the chair. Thank you for the question. Uh, so I've just put up the slide there. We've analyzed here specific to your two routes, uh, the eight buses for Route 7 and the 16 buses required for uh, Route L. So a total of the 24 electric buses is what's been analyzed here. Oh. And do you know how many buses would use per day or per night between you and Jenny? How many buses would you use? In other words, is this, this would not give me the total cost per week, right? It would just be for that portion? Through the chair, these are the number of buses that are needed to achieve the headway. So on the, the northeast, the L route, we've said five-minute headway between BRT buses. That requires 16 buses. And then on the 7, it's 8 to be able to achieve a 10-minute headway. But what I mean is that, is that on a daily, on a daily, daily basis? And is this for one day or a week or what? So the analysis is based on that, that's a day. So you would need all 24 of those buses in service on a given day to run those two corridors at those frequencies. And the analysis that, that, um, that Yosipa talked about uh, in terms of the, over, like the annual savings, they analyze that based on 365 days a year of operating in those conditions. Perfect, thanks. That's what I was looking for. I wanted to make sure I understood that part of it. Thanks. Okay, we'll move forward, uh, Mayor Brown. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I, I can't uh, think of a closer version of a TED talk that's occurred here in council <laughs> chambers. So um, Dr. Uh, Petrunik, thank you very much for that presentation. And there's a lot of information here to process. But uh, the bottom line, I think, is that this is another chance for London to lead by moving uh, with electric buses. And I'm so impressed to see that the technology, uh, today's technology, uh, is viable. And I think that that may be a surprise to, to many people. Uh, you talked about CO2 reductions as being you know, one of the benefits as well, not only cost savings, but CO2 reductions. Those are impressive numbers. I think we also have to consider the CO2 reductions that we'll see when people aren't driving their cars. And uh, essentially, this is the number one thing that any municipality across Canada or anywhere around the world can do to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's exciting too. My question actually is uh, for our city staff. And that's because we've combined a couple of presentations, 2.1 and 2.2. And I, I think that um, this might help frame our conversation as well. Uh, and so by asking, I'm not sure if, um, if the question is most appropriate for uh, Ms. Sher or Ms. Ramsey. But in, the, in your presentation, you talked about you know, this consultation process being an opportunity to fine tune. And I think we need to understand the difference between fine tuning a system and redesigning a system. And I have seen uh, conversations occurring in the community uh, talking about uh, removing dedicated lanes and, and moving to uh, shared traffic for the entire system. And I, I've seen other communities criticized for moving forward in, in that direction. But I think the critical question for our community is in terms of process and timing, if we were to move our process and our system to shared lanes instead of dedicated lanes, what would the impact be in terms of process and timing? Uh, thank you, through the chair. So moving back to an idea of a mixed traffic model is highly problematic. It is a substantial redo of the work that's been done to date, including all of the design, the metrics, and the consultations. So ridership projections, schedules, number of buses, the reliability of service, travel times, even the capital and operating costs would all be redone. And I think it's worth mentioning that the capital costs may not go down as much as people might suspect, because you'd still need to have laybys and queue jump lanes in order for that to be even remotely reliable service. It's a very different system, it's a very different business case, so we would have to start back over with a number of things that were decided back in the last phase before we started TPAP. We would also have to go back out to the community and re-engage. So I think we would be looking at a substantial cost and probably a good year's worth of effort. Um, to me, uh, my opinion really is that the dedicated lanes are probably the single most important thing we're doing in this project. And without the dedicated lanes, this is not rapid transit. Vehicle technology is going to change, and it's going to change and require replacement on a life cycle much shorter than the real estate. The real estate is permanent. When we have those unimpeded laneways, that is our opportunity to do these sorts of things, to do electric buses, to look at autonomous vehicles, to look at trackless tram technology in the future. Without that real estate, it, it's really a very different system and it is a redo for us. So, I mean, I think the short answer is, this is an opportunity for London to lead or not. And my follow-up question is for Dr. Pertunek, and uh, Ms. Sher touched on this, but how important are dedicated lanes to moving with uh, a plan that uh, allows for electric buses? Thank you very much through the chair. Um, I was just going to flip back here to the energy consumption modeling. So there's a physics component to it. If you don't have dedicated laneway, then you don't have as smooth ridership patterns. So your acceleration, your deceleration are a lot less smoother. There's a lot more stopping and starting due to congestion, whether that's stopping for a car in front of you or stopping for a car turning or just what whatever may be impeding you. As a result, this nice figure of under five minutes of charging could change significantly. We're currently in the process at QTRIG of running some new modeling for TTC where we're looking at congestion mapping. Uh, and congestion mapping means that even though you know the, the average speed of your road is 40 kilometers an hour, your actual speed is 10 kilometers an hour, plus stopping and starting. So 10 kilometers an hour at constant speed versus 10 kilometers an hour of stopping and starting is two very different energy consumption patterns. The second one is a lot worse. So what you would see here potentially, and I'd have to rerun it, I couldn't necessarily guess, but I would guess 
guess if we took the exact same route, same vehicle, same topography, same ridership, and we put it on a mixed traffic laneway with stopping and starting due to congestion, uh, you'd probably be near to, if not over that five minute mark of charging. Uh, just because the energy consumption would be so much higher every time you slow down and start, again, to accelerate, you burn or use a lot more electrons than you harvest from regenerative braking. So from the energy standpoint, it's a worse story. It's a much worse story. Uh, it's possible, but it's a worse story. From a performance uh, standpoint, of course, rapid transit way implies rapid. And although you have iterated the idea of getting more people on the bus for CO2 reductions, I'm a busy woman, I don't have time to drive. Uh, so I love the productivity story. And I think there's a lot of people out there with kids, with jobs, daycare, things to get to where they need to get to those places on time or while they're on the vehicle, they need to work, they need to take calls, they need to get things done before they get home. So a rapid transit way that allows for the productive labor hours of people who live in London has an effect economically over and above a congested uh, transit line. So those are, those are two elements that are often not calculated. We ourselves at Qtrick have not started a productivity modeling exercise that we intend to next year and that is the labor hours that are lost due to congestion including in transit so I would say there's the social economic component of if you lose your dedicated laneways it's not only not rapid you're probably losing labor productivity oh, uh, thank you I think that that helps frame the discussion well uh, and my kids who just started their summer break would say that was too much physics and science uh, for a July afternoon. This has been really fascinating information, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, the presentation and, and thank staff for their answers as well. Okay, we'll move forward to you, Councillor Helmer. Oh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, I have to say I'm really happy that we put in a preference for electric vehicles uh, way back uh, when we were initially planning the project and said we need to make sure we look at this uh, I think we just saw in the presentation some of the benefits, many benefits, of uh, proceeding with an electric fleet uh, for rapid transit. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions because I think uh, it's going to be important to get some clarity about it. Um, there was a lot in the presentation. One of the parts that you kind of skipped over was uh, rolling resistance and its effect on the calculations. So do you know and is there some kind of order of magnitude difference between concrete and asphalt? Through the chair, that's a fantastic question. Um, in fact, I can tell you that when we first took a look at tires, we didn't think they would have an effect as much as they did. And we realized the tire technology actually had, in some cases, percentage points of an effect on state of charge. We have not modeled yet materials on the road. It would be certainly worthwhile. Uh, and if there is a materials interest that uh, this community has, for example, your rapid transit way is being intended as pure concrete, concrete mixtures, asphalt mixtures, et cetera, we could, in fact, model that out in terms of the friction and the effect that that would have on your state of charge. Currently, I don't have the answer, unfortunately, but it's certainly worthwhile investigating. Oops, sorry. Uh, thank you. The uh, uh, reason I ask, and colleagues will be familiar with it, um, uh, the uh, Cement Association, number of people, they make a lot of claims about what the difference is between the different services, and just looking at how small changes in the modeling can affect the overall results, I imagine it would probably have an effect, just like tires and and so on. Uh, the question is how big is it going to be? And I think uh, that's worth exploring. Uh, certainly, I think if we've got the right kind of soil uh, for concrete and we can manage it, I think it's going to make sense on a sort of life cycle basis to put that in. But obviously, that's why we have engineers. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to just summarize what I think I heard in terms of the overall impact. So the, there was $300,000 in energy cost savings on the one route and $600,000 in energy cost savings on the other route, rough figures. So we're talking about $900,000 of savings in energy costs, electric versus, okay. So that's obviously awesome. Uh, then we have uh, about 4,800 4, and change tons of greenhouse gas emissions on top of all the greenhouse gas emissions we've already included in the business case. So that was 1,500 or so for the seven and 3260 something for the L. So uh, that's quite a lot in one year, and it's even more when you start adding it up over the whole life cycle of the project. It looks to me just ballpark figures like we're talking about 30%, 29-30% more greenhouse gases uh, reduced than what's in the business case modeling now. Um, and that, that was 234,000 total over the whole life cycle of the project. Um, this is looking like it's increasing it by 29%. So it's going to be cheaper 
Uh, also keep in mind we're the shareholder for London Hydro, so when we pay some of these costs, it's going back to ourselves, which is great, um, compared to uh, where it's going right now, which is not to the City of London at all. And uh, I think this is starting to show the financial modeling. Um, one question I have for, and the benefits of this kind of switch, one question I have for our staff is I know in the business case, we use the operating costs for diesel, but we put a capital cost in for the bus purchase, which could potentially allow for electric buses. So I just wanted to double check on that because we, I think we put in a million dollars per bus. Uh, I'm not sure where the buses are in terms of pricing these days, but is the million dollars per bus going to still cover what we need in terms of electric buses? And uh, can we just confirm that the operating costs we have in the business case are actually for diesel and not for electric and therefore they would drop? So the, the million dollars um, per bus, if we're looking at 60 foot electric is on the light side. Um, again, there are opportunities for funding this. I mean, I think if you looked at the, the phase two and, and the partnerships, there are opportunities to have some savings if, if we're willing to partner with, with uh, other parties to, to launch this. So we're not significantly concerned about that at this point. But yes, I can also confirm that in the business case, we did assume diesel at the time when we, when we uh, looked at the operating costs. Well, that's just great news all around. I mean, basically the benefit cost ratio for the project is getting better. There's fewer emissions. It's better operationally. Uh, it's also going to be a much smoother ride for users, especially if we keep it in dedicated lanes, which we obviously have to. And I think it just shows the impact, you know, when you look at it from an energy cost perspective, that's also a quality of service issue with the starting and stopping all the time on the bus. Uh, we want to avoid it because it's cheaper, uh, but it's also much better for passengers. And the quieter ride, having ridden on some of these electric buses, I've been on a New Flyer one in uh, Winnipeg, which has been running from the airport. Uh, I actually waited. I think I let another bus go by just so I could get on the electric one. Uh, thankfully, it was the next one. Um, and it's hugely different to the point where you start to notice other noises on the bus. I think there was a comment about hearing conversations at the front. Well, you hear all kinds of things, uh, air conditioners, things that you don't right now, you wouldn't hear because the engines are so loud. Um, and I think it's starting to get to the quality of service that people would expect from a rail-based systems, right? The smoothness of the acceleration, the quietness of the ride. Um, it, because it's on rubber uh, tires, you don't even have the squeakiness of the rails. Uh, it, it starts to become a really pleasant, uh, high-quality experience. So I think if, if we're doing a BRT right, the best possible BRT we can do in London, this is the kind of direction we need to be going in because it's going to be so much better than what people are experiencing now uh, in terms of the uh, quality of the ride on, on diesel buses. And it's going to save us money in the long run, right? And it's good for the environment. So this is just a home run from a lot of perspectives. I really appreciate uh, Josepha's presentation. I've had the pleasure of her hearing her talk before, and I knew it would be great, but that was extremely good. Uh, you covered a lot of really important stuff very quickly uh, and thoroughly. And I hope that everybody who's you know interested in this project actually digs into this presentation, look at the slides, look at the detailed level of modeling, not just you know how long is the route, but what is the topography of the route, right? How much of a hill is there? Like, I mean, this is very detailed and it's really helpful. I can't wait to see the numbers for the 60-foot buses as we start getting into that. Oh, Commissioner Southern. First, I'm going to apologize for being late. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation, Josipa. Um, I just have a few questions. Uh, one is uh, for the 60 foot buses, do they have like increased battery sizes for those? Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments about the presentation. I should note my colleagues, Anasia Franca, who's our lead research researcher and research manager, and my colleague, Dr. Abhishek Raj, here in Waterloo. They are a key and critical component of the team. We have a fantastic team that feeds into this. So certainly not just me, uh, not mostly me even. Uh, so <laughs> give them credit. Uh, in terms of the 60-foot bus so, uh, buses, right now we are um, working with New Flyer to obtain the specifications. It is a priori, it's not necessarily the case that you need a larger battery pack on a 60-footer in the same way that it's not necessarily the case on a 40-footer that you need 200 kilowatt hours or 400 or 76. It is natural that on a 60-footer you could request and would request higher and longer, uh, larger battery pack capacity because you're going to be carrying more people. It is not necessarily the case you would need 30% more. Um, so right now you have a variable option and because we're at the early stage of the development 
curve, manufacturers like, in fact, New Flyer have the ability to really work with transit agencies to right-size the battery pack for your 60-foot requirements. Here, again, London has the opportunity to lead because you would really be procuring these 60-footers for a rapid transit way application. So you have the opportunity to lead in what is the right-sized, most optimized battery pack size for the size of the vehicle with the full capacity in that extra 20-foot. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, so my next question is uh, the weight of the buses. Uh, what's the difference, like the ratio between them, between a diesel and electric? I missed that, I think. I think we may have taken, I'm sorry, through the chair, we may have taken that particular metric out off the top of my head. Uh, I can certainly send that to you. It is a certain figure uh, of what it is, and it's within the, um, the requirements for road safety. My colleague, in fact, Anasia, may know it off the top of her head. So between diesel and uh, electric? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The weight profiles? Oh, there we go. So it's about um, 3,000 kilograms difference. Um, it's about... 20%, and I could less than 20%, not 15%, I'd say, even less than that, actually. Yeah. Just, I, I, we did tires recently, and our contract for that, and the weight's a huge impact on how quickly you have to replace them. Um, now, these are, these are standardized questions. Um, so, for the battery packs, are they standardized inside the vehicles so that we can replace them from any vendor without having to always go to New Flyer or uh, Nova specifically? Uh, through the chair, that's a fantastic question. Um, so right now it is the case that every bus manufacturer, as with car manufacturers, they procure their own supply chain of battery packs. Um, there's a lot more proprietary powertrain packaging under the hood in electric vehicles, whether they're buses or cars today, than there is in diesel or gasoline equivalents. And in part that's, if you can imagine from the automotive analogy, it used to be the case in the 1960s that a Chrysler was a Chrysler and a Ford was a Ford under the hood. Today they're pretty much the same car under the hood. Uh, so there's been a lot of standardization on the thermodynamic powertrain. That is not the case uh, in the electric bus or the electric car world right now. Um, so manufacturers have the ability, and many of them are right now working with multiple suppliers to bring down the price point and to improve the quality and the packaging. So the simple answer is there's no standard plug-and-play Lego-style modular powertrain currently. You are buying a new flyer-designed bus or a Nova bus or a Proterra bus, uh, and they are quite unique and in their design under the hood. Uh, that does not necessarily, however, mean that you are completely unable to engage in a battery swap, for example, in the future. Uh, that business line does not exist right now. It is not the case that as a transit agency, you can independently seek out battery uh, providers to package in at your refurbishment period, but that doesn't mean that business will not crop up. It's just too early in the supply chain and too early in the manufacturing of units. Uh, so the other question I had relating to batteries are what are the life cycle and how is replacement usually handled? Again, through the chair, those fantastic questions. Uh, so the life cycle really depends on usage. Uh, it's not a standard sort of 12 or 20 year life cycle. In general, um, across the manufacturers, they are recommending between a seven year and a 12 year refurbishment. And that generally is dependent on how many cycles through the battery. So if you're using a smaller battery pack and you're cycling through the battery pack from the top of the package and the top cell to the bottom cell more frequently, you're going to run out the battery more, more quickly. If you have a larger battery pack or the same size small battery pack, but it's on a roof that's not being utilized heavily, so it's not cycling through as much, that battery is going to last, last a lot longer. Uh, so part of it's the cycling of the battery pack, and as I said, average, you can think about a 7 to 12 year refurbishment somewhere in there, depending on your usage. But there are other technical factors that are very important to consider, which we've shared with your transit agency. Um, for example, battery management systems. Lots of times when we talk about electric cars or electric buses, we think about the battery pack, and we're so focused on the battery pack. But the battery management system is the software control system that tells the battery how much can it take in as power, how much should it deliver, and from what cells within the pack. And that management and control is crucial and critical to the health of the battery and the life cycle of the battery. Right now, every bus manufacturer has a battery management system, the brains of the operation. And 
agencies will learn over time, as we have, which manufacturers are offering really robust battery management systems. So there's the cycling through that impacts the life cycle. There is the battery management system, uh, which includes thermal management, make, making sure that the battery pack is within good and health. Uh, those two things combined will affect the life cycle, again, seven to 12 years. But I should note that, let's say at the 12 year mark, uh, what does that mean? It doesn't actually mean that your battery is dead. It means typically that your battery has reached somewhere around 75 to 80 percent usable state of charge. So what we would expect is from day one to day year 12, so to speak, that you have a very slow degradation of your battery pack. You're going to lose some capacity, which is why your state of charge is very important. On day one, your state of charge on year 12 is going to be slightly different because you've lost the use of a couple cells. Typically, we assume that 25 to 20 percent degradation is acceptable because you can still deliver your service fleet. At that point, a lot of the manufacturers are suggesting a full refurbishment, but you can still repackage that battery pack. So part of our project is looking at can we take it out of your bus, repackage it with some power electronics, and slap it to the side of your transit garage or your, your city hall to capture some energy as an energy storage device. So you don't totally you lose the value of that asset. So the life cycle may, in fact, last beyond it, but in a different purpose. Uh, can I just interrupt? Sorry, um, Commissioner Southern. We're going to lose quorum at 620, um, and we still have some items on the agenda. So did you have many more questions? I just had two more, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was also wondering, uh, because you're trying to standardize everything with the, the delivery of power to the, the buses, uh, kind of related to what you just said, uh, is is there anything related to energy storage being added to that or energy generation to make sure that, that it can be added at that point, or do we have to work with the utility to add it? A fantastic question again through the chair. So phase two is actually focused on integrating energy storage into the charging systems. Uh, so as you noted, our first phase was really about standardizing the charging system. So you could plug and play different buses, different chargers. They all plug and play, mix and match. That's great. But now that we want to package energy storage into it, right now there is no standard. So if you're sitting and you want to go to an RFP and you want to go buy some energy storage devices and some chargers and have them packaged and delivered to you, there's actually no standardized spec that you can issue the RFP according to. So that's why in phase two of our trial, along with London Transit, if it's modeled out that you would need storage, because you might not actually need the storage depending on your requirements and needs, uh, if you need storage, then part of our project is to, to be able to publish a standard that would allow you as a city to go to an RFP and play around with the manufacturers of storage devices and charging systems to make sure they plug and play like Lego. So um, would you be able to model this, the benefits of storage so that we could take non-peak energy and apply it at peak times then and when you come back? Yes, that's a fantastic question. Yes. So we are currently extending our modeling now. We're working with various manufacturers of storage devices like ABB and Siemens, but also Ecamion and several other Canadian-based energy storage companies, looking at their specs, the sizes. So we should be able to model out um, the value, the cost versus the value. So it might be that from an energy perspective, it's valuable to you. You can harvest some cheap electrons that are also green because they come from wind power in Oxford or in Windsor or wherever they may be coming off of. But the cost of the energy storage device is still high enough that it doesn't balance out. Um, so we are developing that modeling. It won't be done for about three and a half to four months. So I'm happy to come back in the late uh, fall to be able to share that with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I just have one very quick question, and um, it's about battery packs. And I was at the YouTube conference last year, and they were talking about what to do with all the leftover batteries. And like a China, I think that's... 40,000 electric buses or something they have. So um, what do we do? If we have 24 electric buses, what are we doing with those battery packs after? And I, I heard you say we could power different things here, and, and um, they kind of out, outlast our ROI. And, and um, I'm just wondering, is there any other market for them available now? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. That was, that's a very good question. Um, so the first thing is, um, on the bus side, I should note, the buses, it's quite handy that they're mostly made here in Canada, and the Canadian content's increasing. So it's a great Canadian story. When you look at the buses plus chargers, we have a great Canadian story. And when you look at the buses plus chargers plus energy storage, we actually have a super fantastic Canadian story, uh, because we have loads of Canadian innovators that are small to mid-sized enterprises, as well as large corporations, including utilities like Hydro-Quebec, that are working on all manner of energy storage devices. 
So we have a great emerging supply chain and manufacturing landscape in energy storage. Now having said that, stationary energy storage versus mobile energy storage, which means it's on a mobile device like a bus, are two very different beasts right now. And there is an ongoing concern about what do we do with the waste from electric cars and electric buses, but frankly also from energy storage that's stationary. Because if it's cycled through a lot, it suffers the same kind of degradation. So there are repurposing. Uh, it is possible, as I mentioned, for us to repackage batteries, potentially add on new power electronics and control systems, and slap them onto the side of a house or a building. That is still in the technology world, what we would call kind of TRL 4, 5, and 6, the middle ground of technology development. It's still not technology ready at level 9, which is the top off-your-shelf commercial product you buy at Walmart. So we're not quite there. Uh, there needs to be more R&D to make that happen. And in Canada, we're initiating that. London would be a great city to do it because just down the road, you have National Research Council, which happens to have a whole heck of a lot of capacity in this space. But the current story right now is that it is a waste issue. Uh, and that issue has to be addressed. Uh, and it is being addressed. And the timing is somewhere around three to four years from now. I would expect that we have life cycle repackaging, second and third life cycle repackaging of the battery packs. Um, now, I can give you one last example. Right now, there's loads of hybrid buses out there. Um, so BAE Systems, New Flyer, loads of manufacturers have produced hybrid buses. Those hybrid buses have small battery packs on board as well. And there's always been a question, what do you do with those battery packs? Because they run out too. Right now, they're just garbage. Mostly, they're garbage in our landfills. Uh, they're very hard. Well, some of them can be unpackaged and recycled. Um, and so the question from BAE and a few other manufacturers is they think they can take those hybrid battery packs that are now over 10 years old and repackage them into energy storage devices at your charging location that will be cheaper for you than a new off the shelf product. So that we are currently working on. Um, the full timeline, I would say two to three to four years before I have an off the shelf, turnkey, standardized, buy it at Walmart solution. But we're headed that way. We're certainly not ignoring it. Uh, because frankly, I think batteries are my generation's nuclear waste problem. So we're going to have to figure it out. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. Um, this has been extremely informative. And to hear that we could be the mecca for electrification, that's awesome. That's going to be so nice on a business card. So um, on behalf of everyone on the working group, we're very thankful that you're here today. And we've been anticipating your speech for a very long time. So thank you so much. OK. OK. Can I have a seconder, please? Oh, Councillor Helmer? Both for both reports, yep. All in favor? Thank you. So moving on to item number 3.1, third report of the Rapid Transit Implementation Working Group. Uh, we just need consent. Uh, OK, Mayor Brown and Commissioner Shepard, all in favor? Thank you. Moving to items for discussion, the briefing package. Uh, is there anything in addition? This is just what you, what you presented already? This is what we had circulated to the working group and to other partners ahead of our TPAP process okay. so they were aware of what to expect. That's all. So we'll, I'll just take a mover and a seconder for that. Uh, Council, Mayor Brown and Commissioner Shepard, all in favor? Thank you. Did I call you Commissioner Shepard? Oh, I'm sorry. It's more of an insult to him. Well, we're not going to go there. And um, item number five, deferred matters and additional business. I just want to make this very brief. I just wanted to have um, just an update on the audit committee recommendation to push forward the BRT audit. I think there's a lot of confusion in the community and a lot of misinformation. And I, and, and I wanted to take this opportunity um, with you, Ms. Shear, if you could please correct some of that misinformation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had an opportunity to confer with our city treasurer today because she provides the executive level support for her audit committee. The original schedule saw the first round of the what will be an annual BRT audit process begin in Q4 of this year, reporting out in 2019. Because we took a bit of additional time in the earlier phases of the environmental assessment to do additional consultation, Deloitte, who are doing this audit work for the Corporation of the City of London, adjusted their schedule to realign the start of the audit 
with the milestone with which it was always matched, which was the end of TPAP. They felt that there was very little to audit at this time because it is focused on compliance with procurement, construction management, project management, those sorts of things. So they've adjusted the schedule to bring forward an audit actually of procurement processes, which will include BRT as well as many other projects, and move that into 2019. So it aligns with the milestone with which it was originally matched. Um, just to be clear, this does not mean that we will not be providing annual reporting on our finances. We do that as part of our year end through our corporate services and are required to do that and welcome doing that. So uh, based on the recommendation of the auditor, and we do trust their judgment because this is what they do for us, they recommended adjusting the schedule to make sure we're getting good value for our tax dollars going into that process by realigning the date to match the essentially the milestone with which it was always matched. We're good with that. Okay, can I have a mover? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor Helmer. Well, I just I just wanted to comment on it briefly. I know it's not really the uh, in the orbit of this particular committee, but um, I was at the audit committee in February uh, when we reported on the change to the schedule and what was going to be audited. What was brought forward was the construction procurement process. It was it was noted at that point in February of this year. So I guess some people are catching up that we've actually made a change to which things are going to be audited internally and when. But it was a change that was known back in February. And it's a recommendation from the internal auditors. And frankly, it makes a lot of sense because we have other things that need to be audited first. And there's no point wasting time auditing something that hasn't got underway yet. So um, I, I know it made the news. I'm glad the chair asked about it because it was, I think, presented in a kind of sensational way. Um, but in fact, it's a routine thing. It's a very good recommendation for the auditors. And the audit committee is doing a great job. Okay, can I have a mover and a seconder on this verbal report? Councillor Usher and Commissioner Shepard. All in favor? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I just need a mover and a seconder for adjournment, please. Councillor Usher, Mayor Brown, all in favor? Thank you, gentlemen.